lessons. Um, so it's really, really exciting to have him come and speak to us and share his knowledge, um, but on a slightly different um, area of expertise. Um, so I will hand over to Glenn, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure about the expertise uh, on, on this one, but some, some, some thoughts um, about, um, yeah, the, the Greco-Persian Wars in, in the modern world, or the reasonably modern world. I go back to about sort of 1900 or something like that, but mainly in the, uh, in the, in the 20th century. Now, what you've got on the, on the screen um, there, yeah, um, is some sort of familiar material in the modern world, at least on the left and the, and the bottom right, related to uh, the conflict between uh, the Greeks and the um, Persians. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, a particularly kind of stark image um, in support of the right to bear arms in the United States. Um, which has become associated to a surprising degree with a motto in, in Greek, molon uh, labe, which means come and, come and get it, basically come and get my weapon, which originates in Plutarch, so it's uh, attributed to Leonidas, the Spartan uh, king, uh, in response to a, a demand from Xerxes, the, the Persian uh, king. Let's just sort of think about that, that US image for a moment. Um, I mean, leaving aside you know, our, our various thoughts that we, we might have about it. What it um, says about the conflict between um, the Greeks and the Persians is something pretty straightforward in, in ethical, moral terms. It says that the Greeks represented freedom and the Persians represented tyranny. Um, freedom, which is associated with the right to bear arms, tyranny that's associated with the determination of the government to take them away or something. I, you know, if I enter the headspace of people I'm not very sympathetic um, with. Um, an image from the film um, 300 um, underneath um, there, which you know, is based on, on, on a, a comic book. It deals in, in kind of ex exaggeration. Um, but again, was very much about insisting that um, uh, there was something strange and unusual and, and morally suspect about uh, the Persians as compared with the Greeks, I think it's fair to say. And the representation of um, Xerxes in particular was, uh, was, um, was telling in that, um, in that respect. Now, what we do in... Um, in, in, in our sort of modern scholarship on the um, Greeks and the P Persians and the, and the um, Greco-Persian uh, war is we say things like, okay, um, so um, I've just been sort of talking about the use, um, a couple of examples of the use of the uh, Greco-Persian wars in the modern world to represent some sort of a fairly stark, we could say, polarity between um, sort of freedom on one side and, and tyranny on the other side. The Greeks representing freedom, um, the Persians representing um, tyranny, corruption, various things associated with, with tyranny. Now, when we are studying now, you know, the Spartans, let's say, and the Persians, then we'd, we would say that actually that's a misrepresentation of the Spartans on the one hand and the Persians on the other hand. Sparta was a deeply peculiar society uh, and a, an incredibly um, unequal uh, society, a society built on a peculiar form of, of, of slavery and perhaps the most militaristic society that um, the ancient world saw. You know, I'm a, if I have an expertise, it's on the Romans and they were pretty militaristic, but the Spartans really um, take the biscuit, uh, I think. On the other hand, the Persians, this was a, um, a, an empire that um, managed a huge extent of territory by essentially decentering administration, um, achieving quite a lot in the way of communication, sort of with roads um, and uh, in, in particular, which sort of drew that empire together. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, if I personally had the choice to live in Sparta or live 
on somewhere in the Persian Empire. I'd, I'd, I'd be heading to the Persian Empire. Um, okay. So anyway, that's that's a kind of a you know a perhaps where we most um, naturally find um, the Persian Wars in in uh, um, the contemporary world. What I want to um, introduce you to, though, is a way of um, associating oneself with the Persian Wars, and in particular a way of uh, associating oneself with um, the uh, Persian side of um, the Persian Wars, which is not about this, not about maintaining the conflict. It's not about insisting that there is liberty on one side and tyranny on the other side, but it's much more about um, achieving a kind of an accommodation uh, between um, both um, sides. Um, and it starts off with um, this place. Uh, this is, uh, I think, fairly close to where we currently are. My, my geography of this part of the world is a bit, a bit weak. Um, but this is um, the um, Brookwood, in the Brookwood um, Cemetery. And within, I mean, the Brookwood Cemetery is somewhere which is very, very, very much worth visiting. Um, I'm very into cemeteries, um, it's fair to say. Um, and this is one of the most interesting and moving places that, that uh, I've been to. The, the war cemeteries at Brookwood are, are, are um, very interesting uh, for starters. Where we are here, though, in this image is in a particular part of the, the cemetery, which is given over to um, a group of people known as um, Parsis. Um, uh, the most famous Parsi in, in this country in recent times was probably Freddie Mercury, who may or may not be buried in this area. If, if so, his grave is not marked for, for very good reasons. Um, now, this is the monument of a particular Parsi. This is, you can see the inscription on the front there, which I've written out. Um, the name of the, the person in this tomb is N.N. -N, um, Wadia. And he describes himself as being of the ancient Aryan race of Persia, a citizen of the loyal town of Bombay in India, who lie here peacefully under the far-off sky of a wide-famed um, Britain. Now, the most important thing for the purposes of this talk about this, um, this tomb um, is that it is modelled on the tomb of Cyrus at uh, Pasargadai. Um, and it communicates in its architectural form something which was quite important to the Parsi. Let me explain who the Parsis were and are. There is a, a group of people of Persian ancestry, um, essentially, or mainly based in, in, in Bombay, Mumbai, but in other parts of India too, um, who follow the Zoroastrian religion. Um, and they have had various ideas about what, were the, what their origins were and so how they ended up in um, India, um, having originated in Persia, Zoroastrianism being a, a Persian um, uh, religion. So how did, you know, they have stories about how they came to India from Persia. <coughs> the sort of core story is that they left Persia when um, the religion of Islam came into, into Persia. So they, 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 they fled the onset of Islam. What we suspect is quite a few of them probably ended up um, in India because they were merchants, because we're just along the coast from sort of various um, sort of port um, um, uh, places in, in, um, in, in Persia. Okay, so what have we got? We've got a, um, a, a Parsi from India who's associating himself with Cyrus, rather boldly. This is because um, at this time, and yes, at this time, Parsis were insisting on their sort of deep history going back to the origins of um, Persian culture, Persian imperial might, Persian um, uh, history. 
Uh, it's a, uh, I mean, this is a very big building. You'll be, you, when you visit, and you must visit, you'll see how sort of in, impressive it is. Um, at the same time, it's worth dwelling on that inscription a, a little bit. Uh, the, the, the building is saying, I am an individual with a deep and proud history in Persia and in Achaemenid Persia, in the, in the Persia that fought the, the Greeks. Um, but in the inscription it's saying, I am a loyal citizen of the British Empire. Um, the Aryan race of Persia is quite interesting. We'd need a few hours to, 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 to unpack that. Um, but it's sort of suggesting that um, Parsis are a pure form of the superior race of Aryans. This is a sort of a 19th century set of ideas which become turned into something particularly unpleasant. Um, by um, Nazis, but they're floating around it at this point. So this monument kind of represents a kind of really interesting collision of pride in a deep history and loyalty to, um, well, primarily to the, to, to the British Empire, which ruled Bombay at this point. Final thought about, about this. Um, um, in relation to Parsis in, in, in India. They were the most successful ethnic group within British India, aside from the British who were kind of ruling the, the place. Um, they, were an they were unusually loyal to the British imperial authorities. Um, I have a, a Parsi friend who's, who says that you can still, actually this was a couple of years ago, as you can probably tell, but he said, you can still go to houses of Parsis in, in, in Mumbai and you'll find a, a picture of the Queen um, there. It's probably um, Prince uh, King Charles um, now. Okay, so a peculiar set of um, ideas and, and, uh, and rich set of ideas. Okay, here's um, something Comparable. This is in New York, in a, a, a cemetery in, in New York. Um, I think, no, I won't attempt to do that. Yeah, no, uh, the image you've just seen, I think, I think is a very beautiful thing. I think people um, may, may differ on this. I think this is a very beautiful um, thing as, as well. Um, tomb of the, the Saklat um, Vala uh, family um, and Firuz. Uh, Satrap Vala is the main um, person um, in it, but the tomb was actually initially constructed rather poignantly for um, his and his wife's um, very young daughter who had died. So that was the initial um, uh, in impetus. Um, this is not it modelled on the, the tomb of Cyrus, which we'll have images of in a second, but it is very clearly associating Saklat Vala and his family with deep Persian um, history. So uh, can you see at the, at the top, I'm not sure, I'll use the, at the top there, there's this strange image which is called, called a um, um, uh, Faravahar, um, which is got a little, little man with with wings, which we still don't sort of entirely, we're not entirely certain what it, what it indicates, um, but it is very much associated with um, sort of a kind of Persian um, uh, 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 inscriptions and, 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 and such like. Um, more obviously still though, in the, um, you can see on the left hand side of the door to the tomb and then um, in a separate image, um, this uh, man got a, an academic apparently to write out in Old Persian, an inscription on this tomb, a tomb that was sort of set up in the 1920s uh, or so. Um, and, and, and as an expression of kind of pride in an ancestry which they believed, at any rate, took them all the way back to um, the Achaemenids. That's quite, um, that's quite um, striking. 
Okay, top left here, we're back at Brookwood. And um, if you see the kind of the pergola, the kind of pillars on the right hand side of, of sorry, I'll use some here. There's a kind of a, a, a shape there, which is actually the representation of a, of a, of a woman. And that is actually the mother of the person who's, who's buried in, um, in that um, cemetery in, in New York. What we're looking at here are a couple of tombs that are also modelled on Cyrus's um, tomb at um, Pasakadai, which you now have a, an image of. Um, there. These are tombs of um, Tatas. I don't know if you've heard of, of Tata as a, as a kind of very, well, it's actually a set, I think, of industries, but very, very significant um, uh, uh, commercial enterprise. Um, and Wadia was associated with these things as well. These are, these are potentially very, well, these are clearly very, very wealthy um, families. Um, just to sort of complicate what I was suggesting before about how establishment the Parsis were in British India. Underneath that image is the name Shahpurji Satklapt Vala, who's the brother of the guy in New York, or a brother of the guy in New York. If you Google Shahpurji Satklapt Vala, you'll get lots of hits. He's a hero of British left-wing politics. Um, he was... Um, not only the first person of um, um, Indian uh, ancestry to become an MP, he was one of the very few um, communist, communist, communists to be elected as MPs. He was the communist MP for um, Bassi North, I think, and, uh, uh, and a, a, a campaigner for, 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 for some left-wing causes in the early um, 20th century. He's buried here, just, just by that pergola, again. Um, I suppose you can say that it takes quite a lot of cultural confidence to be a communist MP of um, Indian ancestry in Britain in the early 20th century. So that isn't a contradiction of what I've been saying about... Um, Parsis um, being quite close to the authorities in, in British India. However, let, let me um, um, show you some other images, uh, which are actually images of um, the tomb of Cyrus, which I should have given you um, earlier. On the um, right-hand side there is um, a, a, a photo of an event that happened in um, 1971, where the Shah of Iran, so the ruler of um, Iran, who was overthrown by um, the Ayatollah Khomeini in, in 1979, so within 10 years of this. But in 71, um, the Shah um, uh, uh, staged this incredible set of events around um, Persepolis and Pasargadai, where the tomb of Cyrus is, which isn't very far from Persepolis. Persepolis being, being the kind of monumental kind of capital of a Chaimanid um, uh, Persia. Um, now, at the end of w um, what I'm saying here, I'll show you a, a, a couple of bits of a short film about uh, about those events in in um, 71. But what's kind of interesting is what has happened in Persia in the time between um, Wadia putting up his um, his um, uh, um, tomb, his Cyrus-like tomb, and here, sort of quite late in the 20th century. To me, this is recent history. Well, I was three uh, in, in 71. It's relatively recent history. What has happened? One thing that's happened is that the Parsis in India, who were very wealthy, as well as culturally very confident, felt that they should do things for their co-religionists, for Zoroastrians in Iran, in Persia who had become a very, very marginal and, um, uh, uh, and uh, sort of impoverished community in Iran over, over time. So various um, Parsi charities involved themselves with Zoroastrians in Iran and with the government of 
Iran and Persia, with the government in, in Persia, and had a significant influence on thinking within Persia about various things. Um, it's hard to kind of trace the process, but what happens when the Shah and his father are in control of Persia is a really kind of radical move to celebrating the deep history of Persia. A move from a much more kind of Islamic view of um, what Persia is about um, to a, well, to, to uh, a greater concern with the sort of pre-Islamic cultures of, um, of um, Iran. Um, and what Persepolis 71 was essentially uh, about, I mean, its official title is something like um, the celebration of 2,500 years of Persian Empire. So the Shah is saying, I am the direct successor of the Achaemenid um, monarchs. Uh, he wouldn't be doing that, I don't think, if, you know, I don't think Brookwood is responsible for, for this, but he wouldn't be doing it if Parsis from India hadn't been, hadn't developed their own interest in this sort of deep history within um, Persia, a deep ancestry in Persia that they, they came to believe that they, they, um, they could claim. Now, a more, much more recent image, I think even younger people in the, in the room might accept this as a reasonably um, contemporary uh, image, 2016. There's Pasakadai. Um, and the tomb of Cyrus in the distance with a lot of people. And what those people are doing is celebrating what is believed to be, I think, the, the birth there, possibly the death there, I can't remember, of, of Cyrus. And are doing so as a form of protest against the Islamic government of Iran. So celebrating pre-Islamic Achaemenid deep history in opposition to um, what the, um, um, the, the um, Islamic Republic is, is, um, uh, uh, is insisting upon. Now, on that day, it's in October, um, every day on that, yes, October 29th, on that, that day now, there are huge efforts made to prevent anybody congregating at the tomb of Cyrus. But it's kind of remarkable that the tomb of Cyrus can be such a, um, you know, a powerful and meaningful um, place to um, uh, congregate. Um, okay, now then, what is um, the Shah doing in 71 um, in insisting on his sort of connection to um, Cyrus? What you'll see when I show you um, the, the little clip is a bit of a film... Um, that was kind of basically aimed at a foreign audience. The film is kind of describing these events, but it's designed to be seen by um, people other than Persians or uh, Iranians. What the Shah is doing by claiming to have this sort of continuity with deep history is saying, I have a story as Shah of Iran. Um, and my people have a story that is as ancient and as significant as anything you in the powerful countries of the West can claim. In other words, that um, Iran also has a role in the great story of the Greco-Persian Wars. We're not talking here about, I mean, he's not promoting himself as a, a, as a successor to Cyrus because he wants to sort of have another war with the Greeks or the West, or quite the contrary. He's saying, we are as significant as you are. Iran is as important as you are. We are part of that same great heroic narrative of the distant past. So what I was promising um, earlier was a kind of an accommodating way of thinking about the Greco-Persian Wars as something that if you could trace your way back to, even on the Persian side, then you were part of 
um, great history. And that's both, I think, what the part, what NN Wadia was doing, but also what the Shah was doing. Now then, dragging this back to um, the Parsis in, in India. Um, one of the things that must have been kind of in the mix when um, um, Parsis like um, NN Wadia sort of developed this um, interest in a deep history um, um, uh, back to the uh, Achaemenids was what the, the British in India were, were doing with ancient um, history. And this is to simplify, but one of the major things that the British were doing um, in India was associating themselves with another figure of ancient history, that other figure being Alexander the Great. I'll give you a few um, illustrations of this, but here's a, a reasonably uh, famous uh, individual, Lawrence of Arabia, who, having done sort of his um, um, various heroic things um, in, uh, in the Middle East in the First World War, um, spent a great deal of time just basically trying to disappear. Um, and one of the things he did was become a kind of an aircraftman um, in a base in um, Miran Shah, which is right now in Pakistan and right on the border towards um, Afghanistan. So it's about, about as you know, far away from, from uh, the public gaze as he could possibly get. And what this aircraftman um, did in Miran Shah uh, Air Base was, you know, what anybody would do in an uh, air base, really, which is translate the Odyssey. Um, and his, he, you can find um, uh, Lawrence's translation of the Odyssey. It's a, it's a very, very good translation. It's kind of dated, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's very good um, uh, indeed. Uh, here's a letter from him, though, and he's basically chatting about his, uh, his translation that he's writing. Um, and at the end he says, um, the work's been very difficult, though I'm in a Homeric sort of air, a mud brick fort beset by the tribes of Waz Waziristan, on a plain encircled by the hills of the Afghan border. It reeks of Alexander the Great, our European forerunner, who also loved Homer. Now this is kind of mental. Um, to perhaps, you would hope, I hope you see it as, as that, to jump from the tribes of Waziristan, the Afghan border, it's, it's just so obviously Alexander the Great. It's not completely mad, because Alexander had moved through this territory um, um, at the, at the sort of the extreme end of his um, conquests. Um, but what this tells us is that the British and the Europeans that found themselves on the northwest frontier of India, so the north, um, northwestern extreme of India, were really, really preoccupied with finding um, Alexander and seeing where Alexander had, had been, and as I will suggest, also associating themselves pretty closely with um, Alexander. Here's one example of that, a guy called James Abbott, who um, is not famous at all, but if he were famous, he'd be famous for giving his name to a place called Abbottabad, which is where Osama, Osama bin Laden um, um, was eventually killed and, and had, had spent uh, time. It's kind of a hill station that was um, set up by James um, Abbott in the uh, 19th century. James Abbott was a British um, uh, sort of governor type who was in charge of um, a chunk of uh, territory. James Abbott is a very good excuse me, a very good example of somebody who's really, really deeply obsessed with Alexander. What you've got uh, on the uh, top uh, left there is a watercolor um, painted by Abbott, um, which is designed to show you where Aornos is. And Ornos, at Ornos was a mountain stronghold, the capture of which 
was supposedly one of Alexander's greatest exploits. Now I can tell you that what we're looking at there, which is a place called Mahaban, is not um, Ionos. I'll, I'll show you where Ionos really was in a, in a, in a second. But that doesn't really matter. What matters is how much effort was put in by lots of people who should have been more concerned with staying alive or administering or something like that, how much effort was put into discovering where Aonos was and discovering where lots of other things mentioned in the stories of uh, Alexander uh, was. Um, okay. This is where Aonos really is. Um, it's in a place called Swat which is kind of part of um, Pakistan. Um, it's been identified as um, um, Ionos very effectively by people, um, by scholars, two of them mentioned at the bottom there, Tucci and uh, Olivieri, um, who have kind of disregarded what the ancient sources said. And um, how shall I put this? Put more emphasis on um, what parts of this part of the world um, were kind of highly regarded by cultures over time? Let me, let me step back a bit. Alexander captures Aeonos because all the people of the territory, which is roughly Swat, um, that he'd entered, fled to this high mountain. And somebody like Abbott was using the Greek and Roman sources to identify where that mountain was. But what these Italian scholars, Ducci and Olivieri, Olivieri have, have done, is rather look at the deep history of SWAT and discover what places have been historically precious to the inhabitants of this territory. And if you look at Tibetan sources and Indian sources, even in fact, you can see this in some of the Greek sources, the place that's at the heart of the culture of these people is what you're looking at there, um, Mount Ella. There's a, an interesting consequence that follows from that, and this is all a bit of a kind of um, a distraction from what I'm mainly talking about, but the consequence of it is that if you read 19th century people who were trying to find Alexander's um, Ionos, they talk about it as a great military exploit, as the ultimate example of Alexander's military genius. If you understand what Elam means to the people of Swat and has historically meant, what you realise is that what Alexander had captured with extreme violence, of course, was the most sacred place of these people. That's where these people had fled for refuge. And it rather flips the morality of the whole thing, if you were inclined to be um, an Alexander fan um, to, to start with. Okay. It's not moving on, this is it. Right. Um, a final example of, of um, Alexander uh, and, the, and the Brits, which is something that I've been working on, um, well, I worked on a couple of years ago. Um, I've been um, studying a, a very classically kind of informed individual called um, Harold Dean, um, who was a political officer on the, on the border in the, on the northwest frontier. And in particular, he was associated with um, an event which was treated by the British as, as a, a particularly heroic achievement, which was the storming of a, of a piece of highland called the Malakan. And there was a very sort of brutal campaign in which the Malakan was, um, was captured. What you've got there is an image, well, as you can see from the graphic, of a, of a road being built up the Malakan after the British have, have captured it. But what um, preoccupied Dean was um, the evidence he'd seen of a very ancient road that led up to the summit of the, um, of the Malakand, 
which some of the troops that captured the Malakand had, had, uh, had taken. And he managed to convince himself that this was a route that had also been followed by Alexander in his movements in this part of the world. We're quite close here to that mountain I've just been um, showing. Now, what's going through Dean's head here? He's thinking, our achievement in capturing the Malakand is a glorious achievement. How do I convey its, its, its significance? I discover that we're doing something that Alexander did um, 2,000 years ago. It's, it's quite an extreme example, but it's a very good example of how it wasn't just a kind of a historical interest that these people took to this part of the world. They found themselves in the part of the world which is mentioned in um, stories of, of Alexander. Um, it wasn't just um, uh, an academic um, interest. It was about justifying their presence in this part of the world as Europeans. It was about... Um, in in some way comparable to what N. N. Wadia is doing with his, his uh, tomb, sort of tracing an ancestry back to classical um, heroes and seeing what is happening at this moment, this is 1895, as in a history, in a, in a form of historical continuity with those, um, those ancient concerns. Okay, I'm um, obviously not sympathetic to people who um, get up to the kinds of things that Dean got up to, but I kind of understand why the Brits and the Europeans that found themselves in the northwest of India became kind of obsessed with Greek things. It's partly because Alexander, it's largely perhaps because um, the Alexander historians talk about places um, which these guys found themselves in. It's also, though, because the, the, in particular the British administrators and soldiers that found themselves in this part of the world, to their surprise, found themselves surrounded by kind of familiar things. In particular, in the, um, um, the art that they found in this part of the world. And my interest in Dean is that he's, uh, amongst other things, is that he's a, um, a very important figure in the kind of protection of, um, of artistic and archaeological remains in this part of the, the world, apart from uh, anything else. What we're talking about in this kind of area, the vicinity of Swat and, and Peshawar, northwest um, Pakistan, is an area which had at a certain time been um, um, full of Buddhist monasteries and, um, and, and sort of foundations associated with the Buddhist um, religion. Um, and what people like Dean and other people in that um, area found themselves seeing again and again and again well, were images like the one um, in, in front of you um, here. Very Hellenizing images. Uh, Buddhas that looked were represented very much like um, Hellenistic, uh, sort of Greek um, rather than Hellenistic um, um, uh, 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 statues. This, um, as I hope you uh, can, can see, should be Hercules or Heracles. It comes from um, Nemo Grant in, in Swat. In, uh, Swat. He's, uh, he looks like Heracles. He's made to... Um, um, seen very much like Heracles in, in um, other images. But he's not holding a club, he's holding um, a, a, a sort of an image of a thunderbolt. And the figure to his, to his right, to our left, is the Buddha. So Heracles has travelled as a figure to this part of the world and been transformed into another uh, figure entirely called Vajrapani, the person that holds the thunderbolt and is a kind of protector or guardian of the Buddha. But in the museums 
in Peshawar and in the archaeological kind of um, um, sites around the place, Dean and other people um, who were involved in this area were, as I say, finding material that was incredibly familiar, finding material that seemed to speak to a Greek presence in this part of the world, it, it speak to Alexander's kind of lasting influence over this part of the world. In actual fact, we, we really don't know why it is that the art of this area, it's called Gandharan art, why this art is so classicizing in, in character. We don't know whether it's sort of ongoing relations with the Romans or whether it is a sort of lingering um, uh, influence from a Greek presence in this part of the world. After, after Alexander has moved through, there are Greek kingdoms that are established here, so the Greek idea isn't, isn't the strangest. Okay, let's get back to um, where we um, more or less started. Back to Pasarkadai. Um, what we're looking at in the Sakhlak Valas and, um, and the Wadiyas and potentially the Tatas too are successful businessmen who have um, been educated at uh, very nice schools in, in what was Bombay, what is now uh, Mumbai, um, which had libraries in which um, there were plenty of books that talked about the glories of um, the Achaemenid past. Um, they found there, obviously, many accounts of the uh, conflicts between um, 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 the Greeks um, and the um, Persians in the 5th century BC. What they also found were accounts of um, Alexander's involvement in this part of the world. And of course, one of the reasons why Alexander attacks Persia is allegedly, at any rate, revenge for what the Persians had done to Greece um, a couple of centuries. Um, um, be, be, be beforehand. Um, Alexander actually, um, I mean, Persepolis is sacked uh, and then uh, it burns. But when he goes to Pasarkadai, he shows great respect to the tomb of Cyrus and actually um, restores it. So Alexander's kind of association with Cyrus is, uh, is quite a, um, a positive one. Um, so again, um, well, I'm coming round to the, the same idea, that um, if the British have their myth of Alexander, the Parsis develop their myth of Achaemenids. Both are tracing their ancestry, some, I'm using ancestry a bit loosely there, to a heroic past, certainly a deep um, historical past. And it might be a circumstance, you know, this might be something you would do if you were wanting to promote conflict. You could be sort of claiming to have a Achaemenid ancestry and to be, as a consequence, in, in sort of permanent um, hostility to the Greeks and their, um, and their legacy. But that clearly isn't what's going on. Um, there is pride in finding that deep ancestry, um, but it's not a combative um, exercise. It's about sharing, uh, uh, sharing a classical history, having a both having a presence um, in that um, classical past. Okay, a final um, thought before I get on to the uh, just show you the um, film. Um, which is taking us back to an idea I, I kind of suggested um, uh, in relation to the Shah's um, kind of performance at Persepolis in 71. Um, what I was kind of suggesting was, and, and you'll see this again um, in, the, in the film, but what I was kind of suggesting is that the Shah was offering to the world um, something that the world could recognise. 
um, a history that the world knew about um, and they could understand as evidence that um, Persia was a place with a deep and glorious history. Here's another example of that from, from a place sort of slightly further uh, east. Well, it's, it's a place between what I was talking about in northwest India and, and, and Persia, Iran. This is um, Afghanistan. And if you um, ever find yourself, it's possibly slightly unlikely, but if you ever find yourself with um, uh, an Afghan banknote, contemporary Afghan banknote, you'll find that on it is um, an image taken from a Greek coin. The Greek coin is, is, um, is well, an example of the Greek coinage is, is given there. It's, it's um, an image of the twins, Castor and um, um, Polyduces on horseback. Now this is a, a coin of lots of coins of this um, uh, design which have been found in the vicinity of in Afghanistan in that area because the, the king who's represented on this coin, Eucrates, was a king of this territory. And on, it's on the notes because it's, uh, it's the image of the Afghanistan Bank, the National Bank of Afghanistan. Now, I don't know when it became the image of the, um, uh, the, the National Bank of Afghanistan. I wish I did. Um, but what it represents is something that Afghanistan worked very hard to do. Was rather like the um, Shah of Iran, to give to the international community something that they recognized and something that they valued associating themselves with Greek history. Essentially saying, we are also part of that classical history that is so important to you. So it's, it's more straightforward this than what the, the Shah was doing. The Shah was, was, was taking the enemy, as it were, of the, the Greeks and saying, that's, that's us. The National Bank of, of Afghanistan is saying, you know, we are economically part of the, um, the modern world, but proving they're economically part of the modern world by saying, we share your ancestry in the ancient world. Right, I've now forgotten what I, oops, what I, what I need to do. I escape. Fabulous. And then... Okay, it's going very well so far. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you the beginning of this, um, this film. It's a film that's made um, uh, by um, you know, Persian filmmakers, but they got in um, Orson Welles to do the um, voiceover, and Orson Welles has the most beautiful voice. Um, and is perfect for what is a rather kind of epic representation of what the Shah was up to. Apparently Orson Welles agreed, <laughs> agreed to do this um, on, um, on the basis that some uh, relative of the Shah would fund a film project that Orson Welles was very um, keen on and couldn't find any, any uh, funding for. So I'll, I'll give you the beginning uh, of it and then I'll jump to the bit where the Shah is in front of the tomb of Cyrus and actually addresses um, Cyrus. Persia, a land of barren mountain and burning deserts, a harsh land in which the climate is sparing in its bounties, an ancient land which is the meeting point between East and West, between Russia and India, between Arabia and the Caspian Sea. Iranians call it Iran, their soft and musical language, Persian, on the rim of the country's dead heart, the old enemy, sand, sand, sand. Let me just go to, whoops. Okay, I might need some help uh, here. 
you just disappeared. Yeah, and we're about to see the, the shark kind of in front of the tomb of Cyrus. The first capital was here, in Pasargat. In celebration of 2,500 years of nationhood, the Persian people, led by their shah, his Imperial Majesty Mohammed Reza Pahlavi Arya Mayor Shah and Shah make homage at the tomb of Cyrus the Great, the first Shah of all. Cyrus, King of Kings, champion long before Magna Carta of human rights and liberties. Cyrus, the Lord's anointed of the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. Cyrus, the founder of Persian culture and the father of Iran, the land, five times the size of Great Britain, which this Shah rules today. In solemnly dedicating himself to the memory of his predecessor, the Shah was keeping a promise he had made ten years earlier. As he left the tomb to join his empress and his ten-year-old son, the crown prince, he was filled with a sense of occasion. It had fallen to him, after a twilight in his nation's long history, to remind the world and his own people of Persian pride. Cyrus, great king, king of kings, Achaemenian king, king of the land of Iran, I, the Shah and Shah of Iran, offer these salutations from myself and from my nation. At this glorious moment in the history of Iran, I and all Iranians, the offspring of the empire which thou founded, 2,500 years ago, bow our heads in reverence before thy tomb. We cherish thy undying memory. Fantastic. Um, I mean, when I say fantastic, wow. Well, um, that, that's a... Uh, I mean, it's worth watching that whole... Film because it's one. It's like um, here. I bring it back to uh, what I generally work on: Roman literature. Um, when you read something like the Aeneid, um, it is a massively exaggerated representation of human beings, and we're meant to respect that um, and 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 um, appreciate the importance of what is being described by the exaggerated way in which it's described. But if you read satire or um, parody, you'll find that parody also exaggerates. And you can imagine something very close to that that we've just been watching, which is parodying, parodying the kind of exaggerated claims of the Shah. 
and certainly there are people who believe that the um, amount of um, um, resources that he wasted on this um, this uh, event was one thing that led to his overthrow um, eight years eight years later. Um, but at the same time, I see the power of what he's he's claiming there. What, of course, the key idea is um, that he's um, looking to the Achaemenid enemies of the Greeks in the Persian Wars to make claims about the importance of his country and its right to play with the big boys of, of uh, the Western um, world. Thank you very much, um, Indy.